Remember watch the movie where we have the opening scene and we go through 12 minutes of that and then when the next scene begins, it starts off with seven years earlier and you figure out I'm going to tell you about how I got to that point. We're going to do things kind of like that a little bit, a little bit different, but along those lines. Now I'm in fairly good health and right now seeing you is just happening anytime soon. But one thing I noticed is a lot of times people, when they decide to make a difference, a lot of times it's when they really find out that their days are limited. Guess what? All of our days are limited. Why do we wait? Not why do we wait until that happens, but why do we not accept that those days are already limited? Why not decide to make a difference now? Why, why don't we? What are those? Grapes. Grapes. Good job. <laughs> it's pretty obvious they're grapes. But why do we know they're grapes? Somebody told us they're grapes, we accepted that information, it became part of our experience with these things. Grapes. And if we asked where they come from, we would say, a, a vine, a grape vine. But I bet that if you were to ask children where these come from, they may not know. Or they would say, the grocery store. <laughs> right? Let's hold on to these grapes so I can come back to them. I'm going to do a little story. When I was a child growing up in West Texas, we would go every day to visit my grandparents. And my little brother, who was younger than me at the time, Actually, he's still here right now. But uh, now he's my big brother, and I'm a little guy with a gray haircut. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so he was a young child, and he would even entertain on that trip. 28 miles, not too far, but still, he was a young child, and he'd be entertained. And so we'd look out the windows, and we would tell him, look at the moon, look at the moon. And that was some kid with a cow. In West Texas, we had just a few things. We had cotton oil and moose. Uh, but mostly we had cotton oil. By the way, if you don't know what I'm saying there, cotton, cotton, uh, things make clothes out of fabric, and oil, like the glasses that come out of the ground. Oil. <laughs> uh, we had cotton oil and moose. Not a lot of moose, but enough that when you look out, you would probably see a few. And that was our way to entertain my little brother. Look at the moon, look at the moon. Well, on one trip, we'd gone to our grandparents' house, and my father had gone to call out for, for work, and we were able to fill up most of my family. And so on the way back, we had to stop to go look at this problem issue with the uh, oil wells. And we stopped and pulled up to the pump jack. Pump jack is the thing that goes like this, it sticks up a lot of the ground. And we pull up there, my dad's out there doing his magic. And my little brother suddenly just gets really excited. I move, I move, I move. And we looked around, we didn't, we didn't see any cows. And we realized he was calling the pump jacks moves. Because on that journey, every time we saw a move, so it happened, if you remember West Texas, pump jacks were everywhere. So when there was a move, there was a pump jack. Since we were pointing at a distance, he wasn't sure what we were talking about. He saw pump jacks. So pump jack was a move. And that's what he associated with and trusted that the information he received from us, the identification of that thing that he saw, that we told him was a move, was valid data. So the pump jack was a move. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is going to right? This was a funny little thing, a little story that we share from time to time, like this. Uh, but it was interesting, though, and an interesting thing related to what we're talking about here today, about this whole event, actually. And so going back to the grapes, you know, very obvious we said they're grapes, as you all knew, and everybody was proud, I know, I know, they're grapes. 
And a lot of times our educational system is kind of like that too, where we learn things, we say, but are we truly learning? Are we just accepting the data that somebody gives us and accepting that as true long enough to perform on a test that gives us a result that we're after? Or is it a true learning experience that stays with us? For example, if I were to come back and show you something else like this, and ask you what this is, some people may know, most may not. It's actually the fruit of a prickly pear cactus. And even if you saw the sign in the grocery store that said prickly pear cactus, you may not know where it comes from. You may just say prickly pear cactus, and there's no way around it. But still, it's kind of weird, you know? And so if you don't have a direct experience with something that's foreign to you, something different, how do we teach children about that? How do we teach even adults about that? Secondly, that learning and learning opportunities are endless. That individuals, humans, people, have the ability to learn anything that we set out to learn. The problem is, as children, they don't know what there is to learn. And so they're not the ones that have the limits. We are. In fact, that finally gets into the title here. Learning Without Limits. The idea here is that we live in a system, an educational system, that's in nice little boxes. We call grades and grade levels. And we know, even before the child is born, what the expected level of education is going to be for them. Confucius said about the year 500 BC that in order to have a true learning experience, we must teach according to the ability of the student. But how can we do that if we've already prescribed it and accepted that system even before the child is born? And yet we do that. We run a little robotics organization here. And we start out with things like this, like pieces. Talk, one of the challenges is they have those little gears. We talk about their gears, talk about the teeth on there and how they work together. And we challenge them to build little models. <clears throat> one of the models, they'll build something that looks like this. And they have the little gears connected, the little crank, and it cranks on an axle, connects to a gear, it turns another gear that's on an axle, and then this little flag it turns, just so they can see it turning. I'm going to show them how by turning one side of it, the flag turns at a certain rate. By the way, these are kindergartners who are building this, so it takes about half an hour to do this. But they're really proud of excited that they do that. Then we take it up a notch. Then we say, okay, let's change it up a bit. Let's change the gears that you're using there. And let's talk about some terminology. We'll talk about gear ratio. And we'll change it up a little bit and we'll observe to see on this model, I'll try to turn the same rate of speed on the right hand side by turning at one rate. And do the same thing on the other model. See, it has a very different outcome. My hand here is turning at the same speed, same rate of competition here, but the result is very different. Most adults haven't done this. These kids are five. They don't know they're not supposed to do these things. But we let them. We then step it up again. And we say, okay, now I'm taking that idea of multiple gears here. Let's take that another notch. And I want you to make a car out of it. And so they end up about another half hour later, a little model looks something like this. By the way, before they get to this point, they always face frustration. And they said, I can't, I can't do that. And that's actually when our program began, because that's the moment we're waiting for, to say, you know what? I know you can't, yet. I know you don't know how, yet. And I want you to 
say that, so we tell them, once you say that, every time you tell yourself you can't do something. Because if you keep it in your mind, you can't do something yet, you don't know how yet, you haven't done this yet. That yet instills in them that they've already accomplished it in the future. Now they just have to catch up with that moment. By not giving up, they end up eventually making this little model looks something like this. They connect it. They run it, or they place it on the table. And they run it, and it does something like this. And remember, you're five years old. How many of us that are taking part in this have ever done this? Lift those limits. In that particular class, one of the things we always do at the end of the class is, okay, now that you have gone through the lesson, now that you've seen what we're trying to teach, now that you've mastered that and done the different variations, take that and do something else with it. Do some free form, take some imagination, some creativity, do something else with it. And so there's one class that I'm thinking of right now where the student came up and said, you know, I'm done, I'm done, I'm going to present. Because they also present as part of the class. And so the talk came up and showed me what it was, and I asked him, what is it? He said, it's a plain car. I said, it doesn't look like a plain car, it looks pretty cool to me. I said, well, what does it do? And he had these little upright structures and he pulled it down like wings. I said, oh, you mean an airplane car? He said, yeah, that's what I said, a plane car. <laughs> and I said, wow, that's really cool. See, you know, there are professional engineers that do this as a job, trying to do things like this. Wouldn't it be cool if you were the one to do this? And he looked at me puzzled and said, I already did. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Like that moment, like, the moment they were waiting for this program. We see, because we raise that limit, we remove the limit on learning. They go beyond what we would ever think they'd be doing at that age. And that's my challenge to you also. In the educational system, we have a model that has prescribed limits on learning. And we have a goal to achieve a certain level in standardized testing. Now, this is not a talk about or against standardized testing, but perhaps it's a talk against standardized teaching and standardized learning. And if we can remove that limit or raise it at least, we have a new standard that is a standard of unlimited possibilities. And the conversation about the standardized testing goes away. Sir Ken Robinson, the speaker and author, in fact, he's the most viewed TED Talk speaker of all time since the history of TED. And in one of his talks, he challenges us all. Not for an evolution of education, but for a revolution in education. And what I like to say to Sir Ken Robinson is challenge accepted. And I'd like for all of us to accept that challenge. Whether it's in your homes, your schools, your churches, your community centers, anywhere you go, what can you do that is something different, that is something unique, something that maybe you don't think somebody can do, but you challenge them anyway. In fact, what I'd like to do is create something where we start a movement and hashtag it, let them. In our program, we let them fail. We let them build. Let them disassemble. Let them get frustrated. Let them try, try again, try again. And let them know that it's okay. As long as they don't give up. And so that's a challenge I have for all of you. So then if I what are some things that you can do to change that? What are some ways that you can create opportunities to make that different? And if we're talking about doing things differently, I can't tell you exactly what to do. But perhaps you can share with others in the world with the hashtag let them and tell us what's working for you. 
ทอสอยู่ชัวร์พระชัยยังไม่คิดว่าเยสต้องมีอะไรบัตรมาเดินสิฮัดสปอสนักเลยบัตรบัตรโลกยังไม่ได้ยังไม่ได้เพราะนั่นคือวิธีการสร้างบัตรที่เราเรียกว่าบัตรการสร้างบัตรที่เราเรียกว่าบัตรการสร้างบัตรที่เราเรียกว่าบัตรการสร้างบัตรที่เราเรียกว่าบัตรการสร้างบัตรที่เราเรียกว่าบัตรการสร้างบัตรที่เราเรียกว่าบัตรการสร้างบัตรการสร้างบัตรที่เราเรียกว่าบัตรการสร้างบัตรที่เราเรียกว่าบัตรการสร้างบัตรที่เราเรียกว่าบัตรการสร้างบัตรที่เราเรียกว่าบัตรการสร้างบัตรที่And so this hashtag has led them, I think we should challenge ourselves to plant the seeds of opportunity and to grow a garden of variety. Not just a garden of grapes, not a field of moose, not an area of the prickly pear cactus, but a garden of variety and uniqueness. Because we tell kids every day, you can do whatever you want to do. Set your goals high. Set your dreams out there. Do something different. And so, if we truly believe in that, if we truly want them to be unique and different, then why would we ever prescribe to a standardized system of learning? And so, my challenge to you in closing here: first of all, to let them, let them do these, let them explore. Find these opportunities. Plant the seeds of opportunity, the seeds of future success in them, and let's bond and bind together to make that happen. To grow this garden variety, we may never see the fruits of that garden. Let's do this together to get a better tomorrow.